Hi, my name is Mary Ann Smith, and I'm an assistant professor at the University of Iowa College of Nursing. Today we're going to be talking about non-pharmacological interventions that uh, work with uh, problems, uh, problem behaviors in dementia. This is my disclosure statement. I don't have any financial interests. I don't have any relationships with anybody, and I'm not going to talk about any pharmaceuticals. So you can read it as easily as I can read it to you. The objectives for today are to think about behavior that we see in dementia as a form of communication, and then apply the antecedent behavior consequence or ABC model that we use in dementia care to try to understand that communication. We're also going to talk about the relationship between boredom and behavioral and psychological symptoms in dementia because it's a huge thing that we need to be thinking about. And then finally we'll be talking about methods that can be used to match activities to the individual's needs, preferences, characteristics, and abilities. Where I'd like to start though is just thinking about dementia criteria. You know, we all get caught up in thinking about dementia as being memory impairment. Well, it is memory impairment, but it's memory impairment along with other forms of cognitive disability. Language impairment, meaning the person can't call the words out. They can't tell us in their own language what it is that they need or want or are thinking. Um, they have disability often associated with purposeful movement. So part of the impairment is really a, a, their brain misfiring in a way. It isn't that they lack the skills to do, the, the, the psychomotor skills to do the activity. It's that the brain's misfiring and they can't do it. Um, misinterpretation of sensory information called agnosia. It's a huge thing. And finally, and this is the one that's really, really important, is the, the loss of ability to plan and organize activities, which we call executive function. This is why it becomes so very, very important that caregivers think broadly about what happens in dementia, because it isn't just that people don't remember, it's that they actually lose the ability to hold a couple of thoughts at one time and think about the pros and cons and the differences between the two and then make a decision about what they want to do. They lose the ability to anticipate what's going to happen next and adjust their actions accordingly. So there's a lot that goes on in the, in the arena of executive function in particular that makes a lot of difference in how they perform on a day-to-day -day basis. We also know that a large part of what we think about when we think about dementia is the cognitive symptoms, the non-cognitive symptoms rather, the behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia that we also regularly call problem behaviors. Delusions, hallucinations, illusions, often misinterpretation of real life events, anxiety, depression, apathy, irritability, agitation, pacing, wandering, sleep, wake disturbances, appetite disturbances, all of these things are associated with dementia. In, in some say as many as 90% of people with dementia have one or more behavioral and psychological symptoms. But these are all considered highly treatable and often are quite avoidable. The thing I would like for us to try to do as we start out today is to reframe behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia, looking at the need-driven dementia compromise behavior model. Um, this is a model that was developed by a group of nurses to try to better understand the factors that contribute to the behaviors that we see. And coming at it from this perspective that Behavior doesn't really come out of nowhere. It's a form of communication. The person is trying to communicate through their behavior because their language and their ability to organize their thoughts is beginning to give way. And instead then, the caregiver becomes the person who has to listen with all of their senses and look at this person and think about what's going on and say, so what does this really represent? What's going on here? 
When we look at the NDB model, there are two basic uh, components. And as you can see on the side, on one side we have these background factors that we also call individual factors. And that has to do with how impaired are they in their dementia. What part of their cognitive function has been affected? And then what are the other factors that may be influencing their performance in terms of their physical function, their long-standing personality, long-standing habits and traits? And then on the other side of the slide, we have these what we call proximal factors or in environmental factors, things that are close to the person, that are proximal, physical needs, psychological needs, things that are going on in the social environment, in the physical environment. And then these two things converge so that we have these behavioral and psychological symptoms. Now, they really interact. It isn't like we've got one on the one side and the other on the other side. These two things interact a lot so that long-standing personality traits and long-standing patterns of coping in these disease-related losses are interacting with the fluctuating environmental factors. What are my physical needs? Am I hungry? Am I tired? Am I, you know, lonely? You know, what are my psychological needs? That would be the loneliness part. What are the social needs? Am I overwhelmed by too many things going on? Or am I bored to tears? And what's going on in the physical environment? So back and forth, back and forth, we have these two domains interacting. So we need to stop and think, you know, who is this person behind the dementia? You know, who is this individual and who have they been their whole life long? Because the person who's been kind of calm and quiet and, you know, socially graceful and polite probably will continue to be those things. But the person who's been loud and boisterous and kind of a know-it-all may continue to be those things as well. So we have to know the person and think about how that's contributing to the behaviors that we see. And we need to ask ourselves, you know, What's really going on? Is this really a dementia-related problem? Or is it overlapping physical problem? Have they got a urinary tract infection, you know, that's making them more confused? Or an overlapping depression that's making them more disabled because their concentration is impaired and they're not even getting the information that they can continue to track? How have they been their whole life long? Is this an extension of, of personality or coping that they've always done? Is the environment too complicated? Are they just trying to entertain themselves because we haven't given them enough to do? You know, we often think of people with dementia as being so impaired that they can't really engage in activity, and we leave them alone. And when we leave them alone, many times they will entertain themselves by pacing or, you know, looking through other people's things or, you know, going out to see what else is going on in their world. Uh, and then we also have to ask, are we contributing in some way? We'll talk some more about that. We also want to think about those fluctuating environmental factors. And in that context, we want to think about the person's comfort level. Are they physically comfortable? Are they socially comfortable? You know, what's going on internally with them? And we're going to talk now about applying the antecedent behavior consequence model and how we can look at behavior and triggers and reactions and make a plan and hopefully avoid problems altogether. But as we do that, so many times it's going to be critically important to engage the person, to involve them in some kind of meaningful activity, to distract them away from, hopefully, some other things that maybe they're entertaining themselves with. So this is a graphic that mostly says we are looking in a circle, antecedents, behaviors, and consequences. And although it's an ABC, we actually start with the B behavior. And in the ABC model, we want to assess the person in the situation. I put this stoplight in the slide because, you know, we're always, we, we've got the green light, we're going to go, we've got the red light, oops, stop. And what we're really working for is that yellow light. 
You know, what are the warning signs that things are not going well? You know, before we get to the red light and the person is hitting us because they're so upset, um, what are the things that they might be telling us in their behavior that would suggest we need to adjust course and figure out what that unmet need might be so that we can try to help the person be more comfortable and more functional and avoid those more negative behaviors altogether. So in the ABC approach, we want to, we talk about getting the facts, thinking about what's going on, looking for clues. You got my magnifying glass here. It's like, look at all the fine little details. You know, what is going on? Stop, listen, look, watch, talk to other people, keep the big picture in mind. Because when we do that, so often we're able to see what are all the contributing factors that led up to what appears to be an out-of-nowhere uh, kind of behavior. And rarely that is the case. Usually it's accumulating. So what we really want to do here is start with the behavior. And we want to think about what is the behavior that I'm seeing? What is the psychological behavior? What is the physical behavior? You know, oftentimes it's a negative behavior, a problem behavior. And, and we need to ask ourselves, is it safe? Is it dangerous? And, and who's it bothering? Uh, in some instances, the behavior isn't really a problem to the person who's got dementia as much as it is a problem to other people around them. By way of example, the person with dementia is too warm. And so she takes off her shirt and she's cooler, but now she's sitting there in her brassiere. Well, that's offensive to other people. And they say, oh, she's inappropriate. Well, actually she was too warm. So she took her shirt off to try to cool herself down because now she's comfortable, but other residents or family members or staff are all undone because that's socially inappropriate. So we have to think about, you know, what is the context? You know, what is going on? Who is it a problem for? And try to think about it in the framework of how can we help the resident be safe and calm and comfortable as well as other people around them. Because sometimes it really is as much addressing the person who has the problem. And if the person who has the problem is the staff member, then maybe the intervention needs to be directed to the staff member or to another resident or to the family. So we want to think carefully about what is the behavior. And, and, and we also need to remember one problem at a time. Sometimes when people with dementia have behavioral and psychological symptoms, they have more than one problem. And, and it all kind of gets gummed together. And we have some difficulty kind of pulling them apart and saying, you know, pacing is a different problem from... Uh, not eating, uh, which is a different problem from being up in the middle of the night, which is a different problem from going into other people's rooms and, and going through their things and taking things and putting in their pockets. So which behavior are we going to talk about? And talk about one at a time and really think carefully about what is this behavior and then what are the antecedent conditions? What are the triggers? that may be leading up to this behavior. Where does it happen? What else is going on? Who else is there? What's going on in the environment around the person? Has the individual had a change in status? Meaning, do they have an overlapping physical problem? A new psychiatric problem? Has something changed socially? Has a family member moved away and, and is visiting less frequently so they have more time on their hands and they're more bored? You know, lots of different things come into play. So we want to stop and ask ourselves not only what is the behavior, but then what are these antecedent conditions? What are these triggers about what is going on? And, and it's also really important to remember that, you know, it's more than just dementia. We kind of get caught up sometimes with the diagnosis of dementia. We get our, our dementia lenses on, you know, it's like I put on my eyeglasses and, I, and I've got little, you know, all I see is the dementia related problems. And I forget that often these older adult, the older adult has, you know, other physical health problems, social problems, 
you know, other factors that are figuring into the formula about how they perform, how they feel, uh, how bored they are, how engaged they are, uh, how physically well they feel, how well they sleep at night. So lots and lots going on. So we want to be really thoughtful of that, you know, the larger scheme of the antecedent conditions. So in that context, a good place to go is to say, well, let's think about this internal things, you know, we, we talk about proximal factors in the NDB model. Well, is a person in pain? Are they, do they have an overlapping physical illness? Do they have a new onset of, of depression or anxiety symptoms? Is it something as simple as being hungry or, or thirsty? Or maybe I'm just tired, leave me alone, I need a nap. So as you can see on the slide, there are lots of things that can be antecedent conditions to behavioral and psychological symptoms in dementia that are these triggers to why the person is acting or behaving the way that they are. And as you see down there at the bottom, I have in big, bold, yellow print, boredom. And in so many situations, boredom is a factor in the person doing something that we as care providers or staff members find annoying or other residents find annoying uh, because we haven't given them something to do. We also know that there are things in the external environment that we need to be thinking about. Are there too many people? Is there too much noise? I mean, overstimulation for people who have dementia can be really treacherous. I mean, they're not able to prioritize and shift from one idea to another. And so it's like too much going on is not a good thing. But you know, on the other hand, too little going on is not a good thing or the wrong type of activities. A lot of times there are things going on in the environment. We may be having a big group activity, but if the person hasn't really been engaged, if there isn't somebody sitting next to them that says, oh, here, help me, let me help you with this, or let's look at the picture book together, or let's sing the song together and really help them engage. They're just kind of like, do, 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 you know, kind of on the periphery, maybe distracted, looking at something else. So it's, it's the wrong kind of activity. That goes right hand in hand with our expectations. Again, you know, sometimes we just expect too much for them from them uh, and, and our, the under, our physical surroundings are not really very understandable. So a lot that goes on in the way of how things look and what the person understands from their physical environment. They look at a photograph, they think it's a person. They look in the mirror, they see another human being rather than seeing their own reflection. And then we've got all those darn you are wrong messages, you know. Harvey, get out of Sally's room. That isn't your room. Come on, get out of there. You're bothering her. I mean, in so many ways, even when we try to do it politely, Harvey, come on now, get out of there. That isn't your room. You know, even when we try to be nice, we're telling the person you're wrong. No, you can't go home. You live here now. This is your home. Uh, no, that isn't yours. Don't touch that. I can't say enough about how many different ways we tell people they're wrong. And even though they've got a dementia, you know, in so many different ways, we do understand. We understand the tone of voice. We understand the facial expression. We understand the body language. We understand that we're being reprimanded in some way. And I think it does contribute to behavioral and psychological symptoms. It contributes to escalation. It isn't helpful in terms of helping the person calm down, be distracted, go on to another task, engage in something that's more enjoyable so that they're not in Sally's room touching her stuff. We also know that there are these other external antecedents in facility life. And because so many of our viewers um, are working in long-term care facilities and other places where we have routines, we have expectations uh, about how we do business based on some efficiencies. Now, on the one hand, efficiency is very important. 
On the other hand, sometimes our routines are really contrary to what this person's lifelong patterns have been. And in many other cases, we get into this habit of saying, okay, it's time for breakfast. It's time to get dressed. It's time to go down to uh, the activity. It's time to, because we've got a schedule and we've got a routine. And, and in some level, I think many times residents uh, and, and individuals with dementia really resent being told what to do, when to do it, all of the time. And, and so instead of being really focused on the individualization of who is this person and how have they lived and how can I help them continue those patterns, I'm thinking more about um, how many different people I have to take care of tonight. I've got 10 residents. I need to get them all ready for bed. Um, by the time they all get out of the dining room, how many hours will I have before I can get them all, you know, groomed into bed in their jammies, uh, maybe a little evening snack, their evening meds, you know, and, and time constraints would dictate that I do it a certain way when maybe if my primary aim is to avoid the behavioral or psychological symptom that is kind of characteristically happening in that evening hour, I might choose to do something different. And, and that's what we're really asking everyone to think about is, if you're having a problem, pause and ask yourself, what's contributing? Is there something you can do differently? Because these external antecedents are huge. We know that caregivers often do things to people instead of saying, Here's the hairbrush. I'd like you to brush your hair and showing them, getting them started and saying, here, now you do it yourself. Um, or here's the washcloth. Here, oh, won't it feel good to wash your face? Oh, that feels so nice. Doesn't that warm water feel good on your face? And instead we take the washcloth and we just start scrubbing them up and we stick the toothbrush in their mouth and we start brushing their teeth. And then we wonder why they go, ah, get away from me. You know, that's, that's, that's creepy. I don't like that. That's not an, a pleasant experience. So we, we, we know that there are times, and, and it isn't that people are malicious, it isn't that they're thoughtless, it's that they're in a hurry and they're trying to be efficient. And in some ways, we kind of think of the person who's got a dementia as being disabled and therefore incapable instead of thinking about them as being capable when provided the right kind of guidance, the right kind of cueing, the right kind of assistance to do it themselves. We also know that a lot of times the hitting, biting, grabbing, pushing away is not aggression as much as it is resistance. It's saying, back off, sister. I don't like what you're doing to me. It's making me uncomfortable, and I want you to stop. And so in the course of providing personal assistance to people who have cognitive impairment, there's this great good opportunity that if I'm not explaining to them what I'm going to do, if I'm not looking them in the eye, if I'm not cueing them and trying to get them to do as much for themselves as they can, that they may react to me as though I'm threatening them. I am doing things to them that making is making them uncomfortable, and I am frightening them. And so I'm a threat. And as a threat, they're going to pull back, and they're going to push back, and they're going to grab me and say, stop that. And they may not even say in words, stop that. They may just do it physically, because that behavior is the way that they communicate. So that's where we start. We go to the start with the behavior. What is the behavior? We think about all those antecedent conditions. We think about the internal ones. We think about things that are going on in the social and physical environment. We think about our facility routines and how we approach people and those kinds of things. And then we think about in the ABCs, the consequences or the reactions of the person to the behavior. So what is it that it keeps it going or increase? Or how can we possibly eliminate it? And in, in that context, we really need to think about, do we, as caregivers, fuel the fire? Do we actually make it worse? And in, in this context, uh, there's so much that we do with our children, our husbands, our mothers-in-law, uh, that if I ignore them, maybe they'll go away. 
or if I ignore them, maybe the behavior will extinguish itself. The person isn't getting rewarded by my attention, and so they stop. Now, this is a good sounds behavioral psychological principle, but it rarely works with people who have dementia. What we know is that if we don't attend to the behavior early, often it escalates into something more intense. We know that people who are caregivers, and I'm now talking about formal caregivers, uh, those who work in home health care agencies, those who work in assisted living and nursing facility care, are often drawn to that role because they enjoy being able to provide care. They enjoy interacting with people. And when it doesn't go well for them, they feel a certain element of resentment about, I'm doing my best, I can't seem to get it right. You're yelling at me, you're grabbing me, you're being unpleasant with me, you're calling me names. Don't you realize how hard I work at this job? Don't you know how much I care about this? And, and in that caring position, and really genuinely, it is out of their caring that they begin to feel angry and they begin to feel resentful. And you know, in, in some cases, I think caregivers even say to themselves, now I don't think they say it out loud, but I think they say, oh, he's just doing it on purpose to aggravate me. I just, and, and, and he could stop if he would. I know he wouldn't, doesn't have to act like this. It just, he's just doing it on purpose. And, and we get into this, you know, I'll treat him like my two-year-old granddaughter. I'm just going to walk away and pretend like she's not here and let her pick herself up off the floor and quit the tan temper tantrum and come find me later and we'll patch things up. Well, I accept that it doesn't go that way. We really need to be thinking about what happens when we need to think about the consequences? Instead of having these kind of gut-level reactions to the nasty language or the grabbing or the getting into other people's things and then being offended when we try to redirect them, we need to think about our approach. How are we talking to the person? This goes back to that you are wrong messages. Um, so what happens after the behavior occurs? And I can think of this situation in a, in a caregiving situation where, you know, uh, the, the lady who has dementia uh, had been yelled at by another resident and she reacted by smacking her with her purse. And, and the staff ran up and started pushing her and saying, no, 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 you can't do that, you can't do that. And they were all excited and in turn she hit them too. Well. In some ways, that's almost understandable. You know, we go back to that idea that she's defending herself. She feels like she's threatened. And, you know, in her mind, in her way of looking at the world, that was a justifiable position for her to take. And our reaction really just kind of made it worse. So we need to look at that and say, well, okay, what can I do differently? Um, what are staff currently doing? What are family currently doing? What are other residents currently doing? Are any of those things making it worse? That's a good place to start with because if we're making it worse, we need to really focus on that because the aim would then to be to make a plan to say, how can I actually make it better? You know, what is the action plan that I could develop to set these behavioral goals. So if we're thinking about the person who's agitated uh, and, and who is restless and who's repetitive, and we're going to walk through some of these in a few more minutes. But the idea is that we want to think about what is the goal? You know, what is reasonable for us to expect? Uh, because so many times we can't eliminate the behavior completely. We can redirect it. We may be able to reduce it. We can certainly add or subtract antecedents and triggers, meaning that if there are things that are setting the person off, we can stop doing that. And if there are things that tend to help avoid the problem altogether, we can add that. And the same is true for the consequences or reactions. If there are, in fact, negative things that are happening in the way that I respond to the person who's you know, Harvey goes into Sally's room and he's rummaging through her things and she is all upset and yelling at him. And rather than my coming in 
and reinforcing that kind of negative environment where she's already, Sally, the resident, is already upset. Instead of my saying, oh, Harvey, get out of here. Now, come on. Now, you know this is Sally's room. Or even if I say it in a kinder tone, um, maybe it would be better to say, Harvey, doggone, I've been looking for you everywhere. I've been missing you. I need your help. You know, just something completely different. So, and the idea is that we we rarely get one set way of doing it. it. It often is we try something, we add, subtract something, and then we look at it and we evaluate and we move on again. So lots and lots to think about. So thinking about the antecedent behavior consequence model, let's think about an example. And then this one we're going to think about aggression. And again, I have very strong feelings about this. I think there are very many fewer occasions where a resident or an older adult with dementia is aggressive, meaning they purposefully are hurting someone else, intentionally purpose purposefully, I'm tripping over my own tongue, trying to hurt somebody else. Instead, it's resistance. Uh, so when we think about hitting, pushing, grabbing, pinching, striking at, uh, I really like for us to put it in that context and think about, so what are the antecedent conditions? You know, most of the time, those kinds of things happen while we're providing personal care to the person who's cognitively impaired. There's just no way around it. Over, over and over again, it's the bathing, toileting, dressing, grooming, washing personal parts that where people tend to grab, hit, strike out, resist in a way that is saying, you are making me uncomfortable and I really want you to stop. But that's, that's the behavior communicating. I'm defending myself against you. It's, it's a defensive action. It's a, I don't want to do this, so I'm going to push you away or I'm going to grab your wrist and say, as a way of saying, stop that. Don't, don't do that anymore. So it really isn't, I want to hurt you as much as I want you to stop what you're doing, or the way that you're doing it, or both. Uh, but the idea is that it's 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 not walking up to somebody and saying, I'm punching you in the nose because I don't like the way you look. It's you're frightening me and, and I'm trying to defend myself against you. So it's invasion of personal space. It's We don't even think sometimes about the arthritic problems or the joint disease that people have. And so... In the shower room, you know, we lift their arm to wash underneath their arm, the armpit and try to get them nice and clean and hygienic and smelling well again. And in the process of doing that, movement, it hurts. And, and they respond in kind with stop where they start screaming or yelling or name calling. And so some of the time it's pain. Some of the time it's, it's invasion of personal space. You're touching my personal parts. I don't like that. That is, that's scary to me. I, you know, I don't know what you're doing to me. So lots of things that go on in the way of invasion of personal space that are antecedent conditions to what we may think of as agitation or aggression, but so often is resistance to care. So, we start and go back to the NDB model, all right? And we think about, okay, background factors. You know, who is this person? You know, what are their long-standing habits? What are their, you know, usual way of doing things? You know, what are their preferences? And then we think about their abilities. And that's the background piece too, you know, how cognitively impaired are they? How much can they continue to do on their own? And then we start adjusting the proximal factors. We start adjusting what we do in response to the background factors. And we think about how we can proceed in a calm, gentle manner and take our time and keep an eye on the facial expression, just like looking for that yellow light again, you know, are they giving me the yellow light telling me they're getting uncomfortable? Or are they continuing to smile, nod their head? You know, in the amount of giving encouragement and being patient and telling them how great they look and how much better they're going to feel. In making things doable, break it into steps. Put the washcloth in their hand and say, okay, 
There's a nice sudsy cloth. Now, let's start by washing your face. And, and, and you may need to even just guide their hand gently up to their face and get them started. But get the, once you get them started, then you can back out of it and let them do it. And the same would absolutely be true of those private parts. Picking up a breast and washing underneath the breast, you can actually probably help the lady get started. And the groin is the same idea, that if you can, if you can start them, they can often do it themselves. And then we've got a lot less going on in terms of their feeling threatened by what we're doing. And, and certainly in our bathing situations, is keeping them covered up when what isn't being washed can be kept covered either around their shoulders or around their lap and certainly always thinking about how we are not doing things to people but instead getting them started in doing for themselves uh, a lot of more goes on in terms of adjusting our approach and again these are these proximal factors things that we absolutely can change is you know, giving them a reason. Let's get you dressed so that you can go to breakfast. Or let's get you showered. You're going to look so much better with a clean set of clothes on. You're going to feel so much fresher. <laughs> Smell good, feel good. Oh, it's going to be great. Give them some choices. You know, we a lot of times we'll jump in. We're in a hurry. And we're just going to, we see that they're maybe a little slow to, you know, button their jacket. And so we jump right in. And we do it instead of saying, would you like some help with that? Would you like me to button your shirt or unbutton your shirt? Uh, and, and certainly, you know, if you're going to do something, explain what you're going to do. And I, I know the example on the slide says that I'm going to wash your face now. Probably a better example is I'm going to wash your back. I mean, to the extent possible, we'd like the person to wash their own face. That's a whole lot nicer for them. And many times they can do it if we get them started. Uh, I've seen the most amazing thing. We had a lady at a assisted living environment where she's all covered because she was a messy eater, and but they tolerate that. And that was not a big deal. I mean, it's one of those, maybe it may have bothered some staff member somewhere, but part of their environment said, let's just relax. She's feeding herself. She's eating. That's really important. But she was messy. So after she has eaten her lunch and she was eating spaghetti with her fingers, which was, it was a messy thing. But we walked, the, the care provider walked her over to the sink and uh, turned on the water, got at the appropriate temperature. And then instead of assuming that she couldn't do it for herself, she just guided her hands into the water and said, doesn't that feel good? And then she didn't do anything. And so then the care provider put her hands over the residence and said, Let's try getting you clean. And she just started having her rub her hands back and forth. And the next thing you know, she was into it. She knew exactly what to do. Cleaned herself, went all the way up to her, you know, forearm where she had uh, spaghetti sauce. It was the most beautiful thing in the world. But in another situation, a care provider might have wrongfully thought that because she didn't initiate that, that she couldn't do it when all she really needed was some help to get started. Back to these other things, you know, it's, it's amazing to me how little we say to people when they're cognitively impaired. It's like we forget that they're human beings and that we can converse with them. Even if they don't talk logically, we can engage them. We can talk, tell them how great they're looking and how well they smell. And we can certainly ask them for feedback. Even if we don't think maybe that they're going to give it to us, we should always ask. We should say, are you comfortable? Is it too warm? Is it too cold? Are you okay? Is there anything I can do to help? You know, it's engagement and that facial expression, that nonverbal communication becomes so darned important. And really keeping an eye on the, on their face and on their body posture. And, you know, if they're in the shower room and they're, you know, white knuckled in the shower chair, by golly, I'm thinking we've got a problem ahead. So it's that kind of thing. Instead of, Rushing ahead to try to wrap it up, we want to maybe that's where we want to back off and slow down and really anticipate that that might be the yellow light I've, I've been worried that I'm going to get and I need to like pause and slow it down and if needed, do it some other time because 
you know, nobody died if they don't get a bath today on on Friday instead of a bath tomorrow on Saturday or maybe even on Sunday. The idea is that we bathe on a certain schedule because it happens to be convenient. Um, but the idea is pushing the routine just because today's the day we usually do it often doesn't make a lot of sense. When we think about, so that's kind of stuff we do when we're thinking about agitation and resistance and, you know, just slowing it down. And I, and I know, I know, I hear all of the time, oh my golly sakes, I just don't have that much time. Well, and I'm going to go back and I'm going to wrap up this last thought before I move ahead, is that sometimes when we push people, we push them right into being aggressive, into hitting, slapping, biting, doing something that requires then that we take time and fill out an incident report or call the family member or send the care provider to the emergency room if they've been bitten or hurt in some way. You know, it's like we seem to always have time to clean up the mess that occurs when the person is pushed into uh, a more agitated state. But we rarely seem to have the time to just slow it down a step and keep our eye on the ball of what is going on with the person, talking to the person, watching for that yellow light that says, oops, trouble ahead, backing it off, checking for comfort, doing the things that we know, if they're done on a routine basis, regularly will help avoid any kind of, of aggressive, hitting, biting, scratching, catastrophic uh, kind of reaction. So I'm going to pause with that. That's, I'll get off my soapbox now and say I just know from experience and working uh, with care providers that if we slow it down just a little bit and really keep our eye on what's going on with the person, so many times we can avoid these behaviors. So it, it does work if we can take the if we if we will take the time. So another one that we want to think about today, and, and actually one of the objectives was written to this, relates to boredom. And so many times, you know, when people are in and out of other people's rooms or, you know, got their hands in something that maybe they're not supposed to have their hands in or going out the door to see what's going on outside, you know, we talk about that as elopement or wandering when in fact they're just bored to tears. So let's we'll keep it in the context of, of pacing and checking doors and touching things. But a lot of times, it's recreational. I don't have anything else to do, so this is how I'm going to amuse myself. So the antecedent condition, sometimes it is, I want to go home. I don't want to be in this place. This doesn't feel comfortable to me. Um, there aren't any environmental cues that make me want to stay. And in fact, there are a lot that invite me to go out the door. There's also the idea of, of unmet needs. Some you know, people will walk, and we call it pacing, and it's just physical exercise. It's movement. It's getting up and doing something physical. Uh, in other situations, they're, they're tactile. They're touching things. Well, it's because those things are enjoyable to touch. I'm interested in this pen. Oh, isn't it pretty? It's bright red. I think I'll just put that in my pocket and take it with me. And, and it's out of their boredom sometimes that they're doing those things. It's not a malicious act. I'm not stealing from the other resident. Uh, I may not even be hoarding food because I'm afraid I'm going to be hungry. It's just that in that moment, it smelled good. It felt nice. I put it in my pocket and away we go again. So we really need to be thinking carefully about what are we doing to engage people uh, in, in, in the context of eloping or wandering? You know, what are their usual routines? In some of these situations where I have come in as a consultant and talked with facility staff, the resolution of the problem is really backing it up and saying, what is the long-standing routine? The lady comes down off at the elevator to get her mail. She forgets by the time she gets off the elevator that the mail is right there. This is in an apartment dwelling uh, when she was still community living. And then she would wander out of the building, and the next thing you know, she'd be two blocks down and lost, and someone would find her, and they were thinking they needed to institutionalize her, that she needed to be placed in a nursing home. When 
Actually, the intervention was that we needed to either bring the mail up to her or she needed to be accompanied when she went down to get the mail so that she could meet that need and then everything else kind of fell into place. In another situation, a fellow is He's, he's accused of eloping, but when we get down to it, he's actually trying to leave the facility to go feed the cattle. He's a farmer, and he's always done chores at a certain time of day. And in his, you know, what are they? Background factors, you know, those long-standing habits, those things that are ingrained that we do. He's just going to feed the cattle, and when he was reassured that the chores had been done, the cattle had been fed, then he was easily redirected to come back into the facility, sit down, have dinner, and go on and do some other things in for that were, again, things that were enjoyable to him that he usually did in the evening. So it's really back to that, who is this person? What are the long-standing habits? How can we mimic that as best we can? How can we engage them in meaningful activities? Because if our environments don't provide people with some choices about things to do that mean something to them, that are understandable to them, uh, if we don't provide them with a place to sit down and enjoy their surroundings as opposed to just pacing up and down the hall or outdoor wandering areas, you know, part of the time it's just meeting the need. And if we can meet the need in an, an, another way, then the problem behavior resolves. So again, in so many different ways, we need to be thinking about how can we simulate, you know, what the old habits were? How can we gently redirect and think of that? How can I ask the person, come with me, I need your help. I used that one before. Uh, just uh, uh, Cohen Mansfield uh, has done some marvelous work with resting stations within facilities, a park bench, a picture, an aroma machine that invites people to sit down and rest along the pacing path. Um, certainly an array of activities that they could do to distract them off uh, doing whatever the more negative behavior is, whether that's pacing, wandering, or just repetitious behavior. I'm tapping on the tabletop and I'm singing because I don't have anything else to do. Now, it's one of those, it's not a problem for the person, but a lot of times it's a problem for everybody around them. So we want to be thinking about is there a look inside purse that we could give the person or a tackle box, you know, for a, a gentleman who maybe used to enjoy uh, fishing that he could go through and look at and that would provide him with a diversion that was enjoyable to him. And for those people who, who need to exercise, do we need an early morning walkers club? You know, get those people outside with those who like to walk, and as a group, walk outdoors when the weather is permitting, or maybe walk indoors uh, around a certain course, doing certain kinds of activities, stop and have a juice, stop and have a muffin, you know, walk on around, look at the picture, discuss something, end up someplace where it's enjoyable, and then there is something more to do. There are lots of alternatives if only we try to stop and think about what is the person's need and what is their long-standing habit and how can we match those two things together. So in so many different ways, we really want to think about reducing these behavioral and psychological symptoms by engaging them. You know, thinking about how can I reduce boredom? How can I reduce tension? How can I promote comfort? How can I increase their understanding of the environment? And how can I make sure that the amount of stimulation is a good match to this person and their current level abilities? But then we come right back to this slide. We've got to know the person with dementia, and we have to know them very well. So we come back here, and now we're really returning kind of full circle back to this idea of the NDB model. And so we think about, on cognitive level, communication skills, physical abilities, long-standing activity, interests, and preferences. Those are all background factors. Those are things 
that this person likely has done? Where are they currently in their dementia? What kind of physical health problems may interfere with their doing certain kinds of activities? You know, if they can't walk but they're still restless, is a wheeling program appropriate for them? You know, what are the things that we can do to facilitate communication with them? And then on the proximal factor or the environmental factor, think about what the current symptoms are. What are the potential unmet needs? And what's going on in the environment that may be contributing to that? And how can we change those antecedents and consequences to help the person be more comfortable and therefore more functional overall? So a good place to start is with an activity interest inventory. You know, what have they always enjoyed? What are their current interests? What are their past interests? What do their family members say? And I would, I would really encourage you to use a scale like the Farrington Leisure Interest Inventory um, that is has a fairly broad and diverse array, array of activities and ask about things that you may not even think that they could be interested in. The example that comes to my mind is that we've uh, recently been doing uh, activity inventories with older adults with dementia in long-term care facilities using the Farrington. And on it are a few things that some of my research assistants said, well, why are we asking them about that? I mean, like, how many of these ladies do you think are really going to be interested in motorcycle riding? Well, I'll be darned. We had a lady who not only liked to ride a motorcycle, but had ridden a motorcycle all the way across the United States on her motorcycle in her youth. And while she wasn't going to ride a motorcycle today, it was something that was very interesting to her. And that could become the basis of an activity of looking at old motorcycles, the kind that she rode, the way that she traveled, the kinds of things that she and her friends did together. That could be a memory book that would be very interesting to her to look at and to think about and to reminisce around, which could be a lot of fun. And there was another lady, uh, and again, those, these kinds of things where you think about uh, cold weather activity. And so the RA is saying, you know, I'm asking her about being out in the cold and the snow, and here she's a frail older adult, and she tells us instead the story about how and she and her husband used to ice fish. Now, what a great story. So not only is it a fishing story, so it's a great outdoors, it's a cold weather story, all the kinds of things that we might do around that that could be really genuinely interesting. So start with activity interests, think about what they currently like to do, and be clear about it. And one of the things I also would urge us to really think carefully about is who is doing the assessment. One of the things that I have bumped up against is that I get different answers as an outsider, as a researcher, or my research assistant gets a slightly different answer than when the activity director in the long-term care facility or the social worker in the long-term care facility asks the questions. And we've, we've, we've wondered if part of it is relationship. They like you. They want you to be happy. So they give you a positive response when maybe that isn't actually the way that they feel about it. And by way of example, again, my research assistant told me a story about a lady. She was inventorying uh, related to activity interests, and she asked about music. And, and the lady said, oh, I just don't like music. I'm tone deaf. And yet... These people here, they think I like music, and they're always putting me in music activities, and I keep trying to tell them nicely, I don't really enjoy it very much, but I, I don't want to hurt their feelings either. And, and so we get into that kind of thing. So it's, it becomes really important that when we're asking is, I need an honest answer. I need for you to tell me what you really, you know, what do you really want it to, and how much of it, and for how long, and all those kinds of things. We also need to know the person's cognitive level. We need to be thinking really carefully about what are they able to comfortably do? You know, what's within their range of preserved abilities, retained abilities? What can they continue to do and be successful at? And we know that we can assess people using a wide variety of cognitive impairment scales. And, and getting some 
sense of how impaired they are becomes really important. Sometimes our occupational therapist uh, can help us do that. Uh, sometimes uh, some other professionals can give us some input about how impaired are they. Our recreational therapist oftentimes can help us with those kinds of things. We also want to know about what their physical limitations are and what are their physical abilities, meaning what can they continue to do? What are the overlapping health conditions that they have that may actually have nothing to do with dementia but cause a problem in terms of what kinds of activities they can do comfortably? Again, walking, moving independently, how much assistance, what type of assistance, discomfort or pain, huge issues. I really genuinely believe that Tylenol before any activity, whether it's personal care or going into a small group recreational activity, is just often so important to the person being able to enjoy what they're doing. They have to be physically comfortable. They need to be toileted. They need to have their glasses on, their hearing aids in, to be able to perform and really enjoy themselves. So we're always wanting to think about if they have limitations, how can we accommodate that? How can we help them do as much as they can on their own for as long as possible? We also want to think about those darn psychiatric symptoms. And, you know, we think about depression being huge uh, in people who have dementia. You know, the overlapping depression or anxiety can be very troubling and yet very treatable. I mean, an antidepressant medication can be very effective in treating some of the so-called behavioral and psychological symptoms of, of, of dementia when it's really a depression overlapping on top of the, of the dementia. And antidepressants are often very effective in treating anxious behavior. As, and, and, and I'm not real a big fan of, of, of antipsychotics, but in some cases it is appropriate. But we want to make sure that we're using an antipsychotic to treat psychotic symptoms and not to try to mask some of the behavioral symptoms. So, I really urge you to think about using standardized scales like the uh, Patient Health Questionnaire 9, which is the nine-item uh, depression rating scale that's going to be part of MDS 3.0 when it finally is released, we hope, next year. And um, the GAD7, another real simple and easy-to-use anxiety scale to be able to quantify what kinds of worries they have, or what kinds of anxieties they have, what kinds of things make them uncomfortable, that maybe then we can change the, be the, the behavior by, again, ch changing these antecedent conditions, changing the type of activity that's offered, small group activity, one-to-one -one activity, self-directed activity that we get the person started with instead of always the big, large group activity that so rarely works for people who have dementia. We also want to think about their communication skills, you know. How well can they communicate what they want and need and how much of it is nonverbal communication and what is their usual pattern of interaction and how much of it is sensory impairment. Are they actually able to see us? to be able to read our lips if they are hearing impaired, which means they need their glasses on. And if their glasses on, are they really nice and clean? Or is it the right prescription? You know, if we haven't had them back to have their eyes checked again, their eyes may be getting better or worse. We, we just can't be sure. But it's that kind of paying attention to functional ability so that we're not seeing excess disability. We're not seeing disability beyond what we would expect to see based on the impairment caused by the dementia. We're seeing impairment caused by the fact that I can't see you, so I can't respond, I can't read your lips, I can't hear you, so I say something that sounds like it doesn't make any sense at all because I didn't understand what you were asking me in the first place. So very important stuff. So back to the NDB model and thinking about these individual factors, we think about this thinking about the impersonal environment and back down that list of antecedent conditions, pain, boredom, loneliness, physical discomfort, thirst, 
you know, psychiatric symptoms, medication side effects. And we think about the environmental factors again. Too many people, too little to do, too much TV that they can't understand or isn't interesting. Sounds that seem to come out of nowhere that are very confusing to them because they can't process. Pictures that are, make them think that there's a person in the room when in fact there isn't. All that kind of stuff. And ask ourselves, you know, so what is the behavior telling us? Are they wandering because they're bored? Are they calling out because they're lonely? Are they grabbing because they're afraid they're going to hurt them? Are they pushing against you? Because that's a private thing. Leave them alone. Are they agitated because there's just too much going on in this room? You know, are they withdrawn because there's just nothing to do? You know, it's under stimulation. And maybe they're intrusive because they're looking for something that they're not getting. So really think hard about the behavior and then tailor activities to the person. Think about individual needs. If they're withdrawn and apathetic, maybe they need to be stimulated. If they're agitated, we need to calm them. Think about the daily routine. When are they their best? When are they their worst? When do they really clearly need something? They need a timeout. We know that after lunch, they tend to be wound up. Maybe they need a little timeout, not too long of a time, so that they don't you know, have problems later into the evening. But the idea is that if there are these worrisome times along the course of the day, when the classic girl are having problems, that's when we need to really think about how can I place an activity right here in this time spot so that we reduce the risk that they're going to do something that's more problematic for them and for others around them. We need to think about their preferences. Are they an outdoorsy person? Do they like to garden? Do they need to walk? Do they need quiet time? And if so, what kind of quiet time is best for them? And we think about their characteristics. Is this person, back to those background factors, always been kind of the quiet follower that needs someone to prompt them and cue them and encourage them? Or has this been the big, more boisterous kind of salesman kind of personality that's social and outgoing and loves to chat and facilitate, make things happen? And, and if so, then they probably need to be more the leader of the group. And, and then we go back and we think about those abilities again. If they're cognitive, what is their level of cognitive impairment? How simplified does the activity need to be? Can we take something they used to enjoy and just streamline it and, and really make it more kind of doable for them at this point in time? So it's not riding a motorcycle anymore, but maybe it's going through a magazine and looking at the pictures of the motorcycle, or maybe it's constructing a memory book or looking at photographs, or thinking about a time in history when the person rode their motorcycle. The idea is that we can adapt it to fit their current level of ability. And we do the same thing with both their physical abilities and focusing on their functional status. What can they still do? What do they, what retained abilities do they have? And so when we think about these activities, there are just dozens and dozens of choices of things that we can do. Uh, there are cognitive, sensory-based, expressive arts, things that can be done, simple pleasures, you know, just real small little things, a muff that I put my hands in and, oh, it's so nice and warm and comfortable, but maybe that keeps my hands busy so that I'm not picking at something myself or someone else or tapping in a way that is uncomfortable to other people. So it's also important for us as we match these activities to not think of it as being one or the other, that the same activity can be used to stimulate the person in one situation and to relax them in another situation, depending on the technique that we use. And so, for example, music, the person may be just really undone and agitated and kind of wound up. And so maybe we think about what is their favorite music. We take them to their room. Maybe we put a little iPod, you know, a little personal player on with a headset. Or maybe it's just soft music in their room and it's relaxing to them and that's enjoyable. And we kind of bring it down a couple of notches in terms of how tense they are. 
In another situation, we might put a small group of people together, one with a tambourine, one with some maracas, you know, one beating a drum, one doing, you know, or singing. And, and that's more stimulating. So it isn't like an activity is one thing or another. It's what we want it to be in that situation, depending on the technique that we use. So the final piece here really is that there are some keys to success, and that is that we really need all team members to be engaged and to be interested and to be part of keeping people engaged in something that's meaningful. We need all team members to know the person well and to know what the antecedent conditions are, what some of the consequences are that make it worse, and to think about how can we change direction to keep that person more comfortable. So in summary, behavioral and psychological symptoms in dementia are really very treatable and often very avoidable. Our goal really is to prevent behaviors. So knowing the person well and thinking about these long-standing, on the background factors, these long-standing habits and preferences and all of the activities that they have enjoyed over their lifetime. The gardening that the lady maybe can't do anymore because she's wheelchair bound. But if we get her some potted plants, or a raised bed, she can continue to put her fingers in the dirt and that feels so enjoyable. And isn't that so much better than her rummaging through somebody else's belongings? So lifelong activities, preferences, habits, knowing what their current level of ability is, and really thinking about all of these interactions thoughtfully. And I, I try to put a lot of emphasis on the full the big picture. So in summary, we're thinking carefully about these environmental factors that act as antecedents to behavioral and psychological symptoms, the physical needs, the psychological needs, social needs, environment, uh, and certainly the environment that we create in our nursing home, assisted living, and home care situations. Problem solve using the antecedent behavior consequence model. And finally, engaging in meaningful activities, really thinking about how individualized activities are both feasible and essential to quality of life for people with dementia. Selecting activities depends on those darned assessments, thinking about what else is going on, what is the person able to do, and remembering that teamwork is absolutely the critical factor in achieving the desired outcomes. And I would just like to close by saying, you know, we have to always evaluate our outcomes because what works in one situation may not work in another switch situation. What works for one resident won't work for another. What works for one resident may work one time and it doesn't work the next time. So we need to always be thinking carefully about did the plan work? Did any part of the plan work? If not, why not? Was it because one of the players didn't do their job? Maybe the nursing assistant wasn't as quick to recognize that the person needed to toilet, and so then the person is up and trying to leave the activity. Um, and so, you know, what are the things that get in the way? What are the things that makes that make a difference? And then always that, and what now? Where do we go from here? With that, that concludes uh, our program today about non-pharmacological interventions for older adults who have dementia uh, to address the often uh, the often common behavioral and psychological symptoms uh, that that co-occur uh, with the dementia but at the sa at the same time are very treatable and often are also quite preventable thank you very much <music>